Hello, this is Steve Kovert here from Learn Surfacing, here to give you some tips and tricks on Alias to help you in your surfacing career. You've no doubt seen lots of the excellent work that people have put up online and you felt inspired to do a similar thing yourself. So you may well have spent many hours trying to create a model, working nights, evenings, weekends. Finally, you finish the model, but you take a look at it and you think, well, it's not as good as the people online and you're pretty much exhausted by all the effort. So you've come to realize that Alias is actually much harder than you first thought and you wonder how experienced people can make it look so easy. Well, you've come to the right place. I'm going to reveal five secrets to creating alias models without all of the pain. Uh, before we start though, why not download my quick guide to pro alias surfacing, which is in the link below. The fact is that everyone who tries to learn alias struggles at the start. Firstly, the interface is very challenging and there are so many tools available. Which ones should we use? Which ones should we leave out? Secondly, there are major challenges in trying to master the surfacing process. Users with an engineering background usually struggle with the aesthetic aspects of Alias, whereas car designers tend to struggle with the technical aspects and the engineering side of surfacing. I had a very similar experience myself when I started surfacing back in 1988. I came from an aeronautical engineering background Although I was keen on art, my first experience of surfacing was on a CAD system, which was very clunky compared with Alias. And I then moved on to Isomsurf. That was my first real surfacing system. And then I started learning Alias. The biggest highlight of my surfacing career was leading the team that created the A-class surfaces for the exterior of the Ford GT back in the 90s. But equally satisfying was developing an electric van from scratch in Alias, uh, mainly because of the great team that I was working with at the time. At the start of my surfacing career, I did find every aspect of surfacing difficult, but also fascinating. The design aspects, the technical, the engineering aspects. And at this time, CAD surfacing was a new discipline and there were no experts to call on. The technical aspects of surfacing were very challenging and extremely time consuming at that time. Um, areas which took me days then I can now do in minutes because after 30 years or more I've learnt the proper principles of surfacing which I want to pass on to you. Now whether you want to do A-class surfacing or cast modelling, mastering the technical side of surfacing is absolutely essential. It enables you to work quicker, to create better quality models, that can be modified easily, resulting in a better chance of you getting employment and staying employed. I think if you understand the principles of surfacing, then you'll be able to solve all surfacing problems. In my tutorials, I focus on a fairly low number of functions, which I explore in depth. I always try and keep things as simple as possible by highlighting the important parameters of a function and when you might want to use them. If you want to see more of my content in the future, then please can you like, subscribe and share below. It's much appreciated. Now, the key technical challenge with surfacing is that models typically consist of hundreds of individual surfaces, which all need to work together, of course. Automotive surfacing is a very iterative process. And during a surfacing program, there will be usually thousands of changes driven by both design and engineering. And it's therefore really important to build surface models that can be modified easily. I'm going to share with you some tips which make the whole process easier, whether you're doing concept work or A-class. The first and most important tip is to build proper block surfaces. These are the major slabs that define the shape. These must either join, touch or intersect each other. Where the blocks meet is known as the theoretical intersect. Once the block model is complete, then the sharp edges can all be rounded off with fillets. Note that you want to trim the blocks, not trim convert them, otherwise you lose the original surfaces. Now the size of the fillets is very likely to change as the surfacing develops. And so if we built proper block surfaces, then it's very easy to modify the fillets. If you haven't built the model to theoretical intersects, then you have to spend some time extending the surfaces in order to be able to put the fillets back on, which of course is time consuming and also can cause major problems in that the surfaces can sometimes 
curl up on them themselves. So you always want to build a block model to proper theoretical intersects. A second tip is to always avoid degenerate surfaces. So degenerate surfaces are where you've got either a zero length edge or you've got a zero degree angle at the corner or 180 degree angle at the corner. All of these conditions means that the normal of the, these corners is not defined properly. Now if you try and align with a degenerate corner, it's impossible to do it. If you do have an edge with zero length, then the solution is always to open up that edge in some way. You also want to avoid very short edges, although they're not strictly speaking degenerate, they're more likely to give you problems. You also want to avoid extreme angles at corners, so anything close to zero or anything close to 180 degrees is to be avoided. As long as the angles are between, say, 45 and 90 degrees, then it's never a problem. The ideal corner is a 90 degree corner. Absolutely key is making your model as simple as possible. So this means keeping the number of surfaces as low as possible, keeping the degree and the spans as low as possible, and all of this results in less CVs to deal with. Now, for A-class surfaces, they tend to work with Bezier surfaces. In other words, single span surfaces, particularly for the block model. When you come onto fillets, you can have multi-span fillets, that's perfectly acceptable, but you often get the best and simplest results with using Bezier. Keeping the block surfaces simple means you've got less CVs to deal with, so if you're doing any manual work at all, this is going to be really beneficial. There's fewer surfaces to line, surface quality will be better, and it also means other operations are quicker and that your model is smaller in terms of data. Not only will you benefit from this, but CAD users downstream will love you for it. For them, operations such as offsetting surfaces can be so much quicker if the model is nice and simple. Now, another way of reducing the number of CVs is to gently push the CVs into corners where you've got higher curvature. This is known as bunching. What you want to do is avoid too much bunching because this can cause you problems, um, particularly when you try and extend a surface which is heavily bunched you'll often find that it will curl up. Now, the thing that so many people find very difficult is aligning surfaces. And so I've got some tips now for how you can make this a lot easier. So as we discussed before, keeping the surface corners close to 90 degrees is always a good thing. And particularly when it comes to alignment, anything between 45 degrees and 90 degrees is good in practice. Obviously you can't achieve 90 degree corners everywhere, but that is the ideal that we're always trying to strive for. The other thing that you want to do is try and make your surface edges flow. In other words, the edge curves should be G1 in both directions. This is not always possible, of course, but if you can do a small change to achieve it, then it's well worth doing. It not only makes a line easier, but it will improve the quality of the highlights in these sorts of corners. If you've got two surfaces that you want to align together as an edge, then setting position influence of one means that the CVs along those edges are exactly the same. And this means that you've guaranteed yourself G0 continuity at least. If you've got multiple edges to align, then your best bet is to turn off all of the history. Otherwise, you'll find that the history on one edge is fighting the history on another edge. If you're trying to align a surface into the middle of another one, then it's often best to use the project in the align function this is usually better than projecting the edge onto the surface and then trying to align it with the edge option in the align function. It's very important that you learn how to move CVs around so that you can achieve alignment. It's a very important skill that you need as a surfacer. Often, if you've got a surface that's where you've tried to align it on four edges and you haven't quite achieved that, then you may find that just moving a few appropriate CVs in the right direction will fix the problem. Something that does affect the alignment of surfaces is the taper ratio. Now the taper ratio is the ratio of the distances between the first two CVs on adjacent edges. And what the system really wants is you to have a uniform taper ratio all the way along the edge. If it's different, then alignment is more tricky, but it can be done. The tangent balance function actually shows you what the maths wants, in other words, a uniform taper ratio. And although it's not directly useful, it will give you a hint as to which direction you might want to push the CVs in order to achieve alignment. Well, thank you very much for watching. 
and I hope you enjoyed it. I would really like to hear what you thought of the video and which tips and tricks that you particularly think will be useful to you in the future.